right, guys, thank you so much for attending. My name is Manny Fragilis, and welcome to another uh, episode of Industry Sessions. Uh, today, we are extremely fortunate, very happy, very lucky to have Pete Zoppi, who is a, what's the official title? Pete? I'm a character art specialist at okay. Treyarch. Okay, yeah. specialist. You've, yeah. you've been promoted from, from lead to specialist. From, from senior to, to so senior. we have, we, yeah, we kind of have it broken up. There's leads, there's leads and there's specialists who kind of are on the same sort of tier and leads. Yeah. People where specialists are a little bit more art focused. Okay, cool, yeah. cool. So we have uh, Pete Zoppi, who is a character specialist. Correct. Character art specialist at Treyarch. So I'm um, really happy to have him. So once again, guys, uh, you know, the, the session is going to be about an hour long. Um, there is a Q&A button um, that is located below your dashboard. If you have any questions regarding, um, you know, Pete's workflow, any questions for Pete in general, please, uh, you know, type up your questions there and we'll answer them uh, as we go throughout the session. Um, this episode is, um, sponsored by CG Master Academy, the leader, um, in digital arts education. Um, right now we have registration is currently open for the fall term. We have three weeks left. Um, we specialize in training geared towards the films, animation, uh, games and art industry. So definitely take a look. Um, we'll also towards the end of the session, we'll talk a little bit. Um, to Pete about his course that, you know, his new course that he's rolling out uh, for CGMA. And he'll kind of cover some of the things that, you know, he's going to be focusing on uh, with this particular course. So what I'm going to start off with, I'm going to pass it over to Pete so he could introduce himself. Sure. Um, and kind of go from there. All right. So thanks, Manny. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Um, yeah, as Manny said, I'm a character art specialist at Treyarch. I've been uh, at Treyarch for about 12 years now. So I think it's maybe a little bit rare in the industry to stay at, at a single place for a long time, but um, I, I get to do some really cool work there and work with some really talented and really great people. So uh, it's, I've been fortunate to be able to stay at a, at a single place for quite a while. Um, so I'm on the, the character art team and uh, you know, my, I, 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 as a hey, I'm sorry, can you share yeah. your screen? Oh yeah, yeah. Let me do my screen yeah. share. Yeah, sure. So let me set my uh, slide show up here, and then we'll get going here. All right. So this is just going to be a bunch of uh, different work that I've done. Some professional stuff, some personal stuff. So, is it sharing, Pete? I'm sorry, I can't see it. Uh, yeah. Here we go. There we go. How's that? There you go. Cool. There we go. Yeah. So this is a bunch of personal stuff, a bunch of uh, professional stuff that I've done over the years. Um, so at, yeah, Treyarch, uh, I was a senior character artist for quite a while and, and a couple of years ago was promoted to a specialist, which means um, I not only do production work, but I have other uh, duties and tasks that I do, which is um, not only driving uh, technology and visual fidelity of art, but also handling other engine side, game engine side things, uh, you know, focusing on uh, how we set up our characters for customization. There's a lot of different things that uh, a lot of people don't realize that, that goes into making game characters or even cinematic and film characters. Uh, what you see on screen is really a collaboration and a lot of additional work that goes into that. So, uh, not, you know, like I said, I not only focus on the art and creating production assets, but uh, also driving new technologies, um, figuring out new workflows and uh, working with engineers and other departments to either write tools that help the entire team uh, to help us automate processes. So I, I get a nice mix of art and technical uh, side of things. Um, I've been there for 12 years. Prior to that, I was working in uh, in the uh, film and visual effects industry. My first job, I, I went to Noman from uh, 2003 to about 2005. And then from there, I started working at Luma Pictures on Underworld Evolution. And then from there, I went over to uh, Rhythm and Hues to work on Night at the Museum mainly and a few other, uh, a few other projects. And then uh, it sort of seemed to me like the, the, the visual effects industry had um, a lot of you know, people moving around from company to company, short-term contracts. Uh, and I was 
kind of always into games. So I decided to make a shift and try out the games industry. So my first game job was at Luxo Flux, which was in Santa Monica, where I worked on a Kung Fu Panda video game. And then from there, I transitioned over to Treyarch to work on a James Bond video game. Uh, and then I was lucky enough, uh, once the studio kind of restructured uh, after the James Bond video game, we were making, the studio was making three games at once. And so uh, after the James Bond game, uh, the studio restructured and, and was going to focus specifically on Call of Duty games and do a single game. Uh, one team making a single game. So I was lucky enough to get pulled over to the Call of Duty team and and I worked on Black Ops 1, 2, 3, and most recently 4. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting because it takes a while to make a game. You can go in like two, three year cycles. And before you know it, you know, you've, you've been there for 10 years, 12 years and have made three or four games. So, uh, and that's where I currently am. And I've been teaching with CGMA now for, I guess, what, four years now? Four four or five years, I think, four years. Yeah, so um, it's, uh, I think, I think end of this year will probably be five. Yeah, so I, I think I started, I, I think I started uh, some of the earliest courses in the 3D uh, curriculum and program. Yeah. Uh, so I've been doing that, that teaching for quite a while and have learned um, quite a bit over that, that period of time, not only about, uh, you know, technology and learning new, new techniques, but also um, how to be a better teacher, how to, you know, better describe workflows and things that I'm doing. And it's also forced me to learn new things that maybe I wouldn't have otherwise. Sometimes I'll get questions from students and uh, it kind of forces me to, to research and look at new things. And I think one of the things that uh, I think is really important that I want to mention is that, um, you know, taking a course, taking courses is important. You can learn a lot through courses, but I think one of the biggest things is sort of learning how to troubleshoot and sort of teach yourself when, when you need to. Um, besides having a good art portfolio, I think that's a, a, one of the most important skills is just being able to, uh, you know, do a lot without being handheld, be able to learn things, be able to think on the fly and, and uh, make adjustments and figure out new workflows. So uh, a lot of the courses that I've done with CGMA, while you know, they, there are tool specific things that I teach. A lot of it I try to do is to show, you know, the problem solving aspect and figure out ways around certain problems. Cause every single, I think every single character I've ever worked on, um, has been different in some aspect that there's some new problem that I need to solve or some new workflow that I need to come up with to get around a particular problem. And I've never sort of run into the same problem twice. So, um, you know, the workflow is very similar from character to character, but I, I end up doing a lot of, uh, you know, thinking on the fly and, and troubleshooting issues. So, cool. um, yeah, so that's a little bit about, about me and where I've, where it's kind of interesting. I can cover that in a couple minutes and it's been like <laughs> a 15 year career so far. It's like, you know, in a couple of minutes, it's like, oh, I've worked on a handful of projects and it's like, where'd the time go? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Cool. Thanks, uh, yeah. thanks for giving us that Pete. Uh, sure. and I forgot to, uh, um, introduce our co-host. I know I introduced him earlier on, um, but I forgot to do it during the official session. So we, uh, I have Frank, um, who's joining us. So Frank, say hello to everyone. How's it going, everyone? So um, moving forward, uh, we're probably gonna do a couple of these, uh, Frank and I, and then moving forward, Frank will probably, um, you know, kind of just take the lead um, on some of these moving forward. So cool. All yeah. right. So, um, you know, thanks for that, Pete. Um, I guess we're gonna just jump right into it. It's, uh, you know, just kind of give us an overview of just your overall workflow and how do you go about creating some of these amazing characters? Yeah. So, um, it's kind of, uh, one of the things that I think working in production has sort of drilled into me or taught me is like the, the being clean with your files and, and, um, thinking things through a little bit from the beginning so that you can sort of pre-plan things. So, um, most of the time my, my workflow generally starts with, um, very early on, I may do some rough concept sculpting uh, just to work out some issues. But as soon as I'm kind of happy with some of the rough concept sculpting, I, I get as quickly as possible, I get over to Maya and start uh, working out uh, the topology, the edge flow, UVs, so that I can sort of use that mesh and those sets of meshes as my like production mesh that I'll do all my work on. Uh, one of the things that I do not like to deal with is uh, doing a whole bunch of work, for example, in Mudbox or ZBrush, doing a whole bunch of sculpting and getting something pretty far along. And then I have to stop and 
uh, think about how I'm going to resurface it and then think about transferring detail from one mesh to another. And then you may get some clipping issues and, and, and cleanup that you have to go through. So uh, I try to work um, sort of the way that you would work in production where you want to organize and get things sorted out at a really early stage and then move from there into doing um, final work. So whether that's doing conceptual sculpt work in ZBrush to kind of uh, figure out proportions and form or using Marvelous Designer to kind of block out clothing. As soon as I'm happy with that basic rough form, I'll move it over to Maya, get the topology sorted out, get the UV sorted out, and then use that mesh as my base for doing all of my sculpting work. So really like Maya kind of serves as like the hub for where I do uh, all of the, the building and processing and sort of organize everything there because for a lot you of work. Show, I'm sorry, Pete, yeah. do you wanna show some of that? Yeah, yeah, then you sure. have the 3D scene open. Um, yeah, so uh, this is the this is for the new course uh, that I'm making with CGMA, and so I I cover all of that stuff in the course on that that workflow. But uh, essentially, like I'll I'll take a base mesh that I already have and I'll do a quick sculpt on it to get the form in the right spot. And then once I get the form into a good spot, I'll get uh, clean topology on there and make sure that the edge flow works with the, not only the form, but if you wanted to animate this, for example, uh, you know, making sure that I have uh, edge loops that kind of wrap correctly for different facial expressions. You know, I have like, you know, loops in here for eyes. There's enough loops in the forehead for, you know, forehead wrinkling and, you know, uh, furrowing of the brow. So making sure that um, the edge flow is in place and then I also make sure I get the UV sorted out at a really early stage too, so that I can basically now take this mesh and start doing any sculpting work that I want to do on it. And then I can just continually extract displacement maps or normal maps or whatever maps I need to do, send it back over to Maya, do my test renders and keep working from there. So I, I guess the, the biggest thing that I like to do is be able to um, see and preview the work uh, as, as early as possible. And so that means getting it set up in Maya as early as possible so that I can go over to Mudbox or ZBrush, do a bunch of sculpting, extract maps, do a quick test render, see if, you know, for example, if the pore detail I'm putting in there is too strong or not strong enough, I can do a quick test render with a skin shader, take a look at it, and then determine is it too strong, is it too weak, and then make an adjustment back in Mudbox, re-extract a displacement map, do another test render. So I don't, really like to work in like on an island for too long. I like to be able to move that information back and forth and really be able to uh, see exactly what it is I'm doing and how things are working out. So, uh, and you know, even at an early stage, like this is all really rough kind of block out mesh stuff from, uh, from Marvelous Designer. But uh, again, some of this stuff is triangulated at this point. Some of this is, is cleaned up a little bit. So, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, the course kind of covers a lot of the workflows in different ways to get correct data from different programs and, you know, do's and don'ts that you want to adhere to, to make your life easier. Um, so that's kind of the, the general workflow. And it, it almost doesn't really matter what type of asset it is. It doesn't matter if it's a head or if it's a piece of clothing or a piece of gear. I always kind of follow that, that workflow where I get that topology and the mesh sorted out early enough so that I can do all the sculpting work and then send it back to Maya. So that's generally that workflow. And that also allows me to, to also, transition from the sculpt phase into the texture painting phase. So uh, like just a little story here is that when I worked at Rhythm and Hughes back in 2005, uh, it was just when ZBrush was starting to become uh, more heavily used in the industry, but it was still really, really new. And there was a very clear distinction between what a character modeler did and what a texture artist did. So the modelers would do the models and then they would send them all over to texture painting to do displacement mapping. So they would do displacements in 2D by hand, like painting wrinkles and that sort of stuff. Um, and so there's kind of more of a crossover now and there's the, the, the lines I feel like are blurred now between what a character modeler does and what a texture painter does, especially when it comes to character work that you almost need to um, be able to interact back and forth and, and having clean geometry and a clean mesh from early on allows you to really easily transition from sculpting to detailing to rendering to texture painting and just very seamlessly move back and forth between those to, to do your test renders and make sure that things are working instead of just kind of working solo on something for days and days and days and not really knowing what it's actually going to look like. So that's generally the workflow I use for pretty much um, everything that I, that I do now. Cool. Could you talk a little bit in more detail as it relates to, because you mentioned, you know, bringing the character, you know, 
starting off with the uh, the rough sculpt, bringing your, you know, getting that, it's like, you know, you know doing UVs, bringing it into uh, ZBrush, you know, doing a more detailed sculpt. But, um, you know, could you give that overview as it relates to the texturing process? It's like, you know, what software are you using? How yeah. are you doing the hair? What software are you using for that? And, sure. you know, so that way it kind of covers the entire pipeline of, uh, you know, the character creation. Yeah, so my texture painting uh, applications sort of vary depending on what it is I'm making. So for heads, for example, uh, I do most of my, the, the head sculpting um, and detailing work, I, I traditionally do in Mudbox. Uh, I just, I like the camera in there. I like the brush controls and the layer system works really well for the, for the way that I work with using um, texturing XYZ to do the detail work. So because I'm doing the sculpting and detailing in Mudbox, I also do the texture painting in there as well so that I can kind of connect the sculpt with the textures and make sure that everything is working correctly there. Uh, other things though, I'll send out to different programs to do texture painting. So, uh, accessories, gear, clothing, that sort of stuff I'll actually do in mostly in substance painter. So, uh, substance painter is traditionally used for game pipelines and game workflows, but, uh, it's starting to be used more and more as the tool set improves. It's starting to be used more and more with film and uh, cinematic, uh, type of work. And so the great thing in there is that you're texture painting uh, all of your layers and all of your channels at the same time. So you're working on color, gloss, height, all of that stuff is happening uh, in tandem at the same time. So everything's kind of connected up nicely. So, um, and it's, it, they have great materials in there, great masking tools. So I can get stuff into painter, uh, do a bunch of work really quickly and even just get a quick first pass of a, of a piece of clothing or a piece of gear within like a half hour to an hour, I can get something basic going, start test rendering, and then determine where I need to plus it up or where I need to add more edge wear or, or detail or grime or that sort of stuff. So um, yeah, the, the, the where I texture paint kind of varies depending on what the asset is. So organic stuff. Um, and, and the other thing too is I'll use for, for heads, for example, is I'll use uh, Mudbox as well because um, it, really, it supports uh, multi UV tile stuff really well. Painter kind of supports it, but not 100% in the, in the sense that it allows you to paint over each of these individual UV tiles. So Mudbox allows you to paint over these really easily. It'll extract your displacement maps really quickly over these tiles. So uh, anything where I have multi UV tile stuff, I'll, I'll also use uh, Mudbox. Mari is another one that's used pretty heavily. It's one of those pieces of software that I just, I haven't, uh, uh, I guess I haven't fully needed yet and, and haven't uh, devoted any time to actually learning it yet, yet because most of the, the work that I do, I can achieve it in uh, between Mudbox and Substance Painter and then maybe a little bit of Photoshop in there as well. Um, do you, have, then, a, do you have, I'm sorry, um, Pete, no, do you ahead. have the character in Substance? Uh, no, currently this character is not in Substance yet. Uh, I'm actually still recording some of the, the last few weeks of content. And so I'm currently at the point where I'm getting uh, clean sculpted meshes of all of the accessories and the clothing. Okay. And I haven't gotten everything into, into paint yet. Substance. What yeah. about in Mudbox? Do you have uh, some of the textures we can look at in Mudbox? Or? Um, yeah, let me see if, well, what I'll do is the scene is really pretty heavy. Let me, yeah, let me load it up here and see if it'll... Uh, because I have the I have the head in there subdivided up to like I think it's like sixty million polygons. You could probably kill Maya just in case if it starts to you know. Yeah, let's up. see. So let's uh, yeah, let's load this up and see if it'll it'll take a second to load. So I'll just while it's loading, I'll, I'll keep this up. I can yeah. talk. I know you mentioned something about hair too. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So while that's while that's loading, I'll I'll talk about some of the hair stuff here. So, um, so the hair um, uh, using uh, XGen's interactive groom for doing most of the hair work now. I spent the past few years kind of experimenting and using test scenes and uh, different heads. Uh, some of it, uh, which was in the, in the slideshow, were kind of tests for different skin shaders and hair testing. So I'm using Interactive Groom now and it's really pretty cool. It's a little buggy at times, but it's really cool because for example, on the brows here, let's, uh, let's isolate those. So the brows here are comprised of a few of these different layers to get the overall look. So the first thing is just selecting a bunch of faces and growing hair uh, off of those, uh, off of that face selection. And then I'll use um, these guide curves here to kind of get the basic direction and flow of the hair in place. 
And then once that's done, let's turn that off so we can kind of see it. Um, so that gets the basic overall general flow. So I don't have to sit here and comb every single hair into the right direction. The guide hairs kind of take care of the, the large scale direction. And then I'll use, um, there's different modifiers. So I'll use like different sculpt modifiers in here, uh, which are basically like layers. And there's a whole bunch of cool brushes up here where you can control density and width of the hairs, the length. Um, there's all these different cool controls. So it's really like sculpting and I can come in here and you can see, I basically just start thinning out the density um, of the hairs just to shape it a little bit better. And then there's cool stuff like clump modifiers where you can clump the hairs together. Then I'll add some little bit of noise on top of that to kind of break that up. But I still have some clumps in here. And then the final thing I'll usually do is just one more sort of adjustment sculpt layer on the top that just lets me adjust little areas uh, one at a time. So you can see like I have a really thick hair here and a thin hair here. It, uh, this one was kind of clipping into the mesh. It just lets me kind of correct any sort of stray random hairs or hairs that are too frizzy. Uh, I'll kind of correct that with this final layer. So uh, that's kind of been the general workflow. And some of them, some of the different hair chunks here have significantly more layers depending on what I need to control. Other ones have significantly less when it's when there's not a lot going on there. So like nostril hairs here, uh, you know, there's not really a lot here. It's just uh, some general hairs in here, uh, a few little adjustments, nothing major here. I just wanted to get some hair in there. So uh, yeah, it's it's really pretty awesome. There's some pluses and minuses to interactive groom versus the core uh, X-Gen functionality that Maya has. And uh, it kind of depends on what you're trying to do. But for the most part, I can do most of what I want with the interactive groom. And it's really like sculpting. I mean, you're, you're just making layers and adjusting things on the fly. And it's really kind of non-destructive. So you can... Um, you can you can layer in as many things as you want. You can adjust the density later on if you want. You can rebuild the the curve count however you want. There's there's a lot of interesting things that it can do. Uh, let me pop over to here and see if this guy loaded. No, it's still loading. Sometimes these files take a while to load. I oh there we go. Okay. All right. So let's do this. So I have a whole bunch of. Uh, there's a whole bunch of layers on here, sculpt layers. And this is, I, I really like this um, functionality in here because I have all of these different, so you can see these ones called red, green, blue. These are actually coming from texturing XYZ, uh, which I use almost entirely now uh, on a lot of my heads. There's a lot of stuff that's actually hand sculpted. Sometimes I'll get areas that don't quite work with texturing XYZ. So I will uh, hand sculpt certain areas in like these cheek pores, for example. Um, a lot of these are, I've kind of smoothed things over and then hand sculpted in, uh, different cheek pores using different stamps and alphas. Oops. Um, and so I have all these layers and what I can easily do, like, as, as I was mentioning before with, um, having my scene set up in Maya and having UVs on this is if I determine that, you know, these pores aren't quite deep enough, I can come in here, bump the, the, the strength of this to like a hundred, for example, re-extract a displacement map, test render it in Maya, make sure it's looking correct. And, and I can kind of work that way. So the, the layering system in here is really great and it's really non-destructive because you can use uh, layer masking. So at any time, I don't have to erase a layer. I can use the mask brush. It works exactly like a layer mask in Photoshop. I can come in here and for example, if these cheek pores, I want to kind of remove some of these cheek pores, I can just tone that down a little bit and I can hold down control to bring it back. So um, for this type of work, uh, you know, I, I, I see people use ZBrush. ZBrush does some really great things. I just have gotten used to the way that this layer system works and the way a lot of these brushes work. And so for me, it's really, um, really easy to come and make adjustments in here. And then for the textures, uh, let's turn on this. So this actually started off as um, a, a color projection from some cross-polarized photography. And I blended a few different sets of cross-polarized photography to project onto here. And then uh, from there, I started hand painting a lot of stuff in. So I started painting in little veins, uh, little spots, uh, you know, areas where the skin's a little bit more red, uh, little bits of veining in the ears. So again, it's one of those where I get the initial projection on there 
save out that that texture, bring it into Maya, test render, and then start to start to determine where I need to start making adjustments. A lot of times, you know, under the eyes, there may be too much shading, for example, in some of these areas. So I'll go and hand paint all that stuff out. But I always test render first and see, you know, what's looking good and what's not, and then make make determinations based on what I'm seeing in the render, as opposed to making determinations just based purely on what I'm seeing in the viewport. Some stuff uh, I'll. I kind of can tell early on where things will be an issue and I'll just quickly paint it out. Uh, a lot of times when you're projecting ears, I've never had ears project nicely from photographs. There's always too much shading and subsurface and all this stuff built in. So a lot of times I'll just completely paint back over the ear. Um, I can, you know, I can tell those areas are always going to be problematic. So I'll, I'll, I'll fix that from the beginning. And then I'll come in and I'll use the, uh, the sculpt as a guide, for example, to add in like little blackheads where there's a poor indent. I can add in these little spots where there's a uh, poor detail. So this allows me, like I said, to just move back and forth very easily between the sculpt and the texture painting. Uh, and then I can start doing the test renders. So that's kind of the, the workflow that I'm using. This actually had more layers. Uh, there was a point I had like four or five different color layers on here, but I collapsed it all down once I got to a point where I was pretty happy. Uh, sometimes I find if I like maintain layers for too long, there's, there's a point in which I like kind of force myself to commit into something and just flatten things down and use that as my uh, place to keep working from. Sometimes when I start stacking up too many layers, it, get, it can be a little tough to manage all these different layers and, and balancing everything. So sometimes I'll just flatten things down and keep working from there. Um, yes. Yeah. So that's kind of the, that's the, some of the reasons I, the course as well, I, I go through all the different brushes and all the stuff that I use and how I go about doing it. And there's a lot of pretty cool workflows that I, that I cover uh, in the, in the course on how to do this stuff. Cool. Uh, I mean, it looks freaking amazing, dude. Uh, do you have any of the test renders? Yeah. yeah. So let me, right? yeah, let me, I know uh, they're very early uh work in progress but, yeah let me bring um, up uh so what i do is i'll test render in maya and then i usually bring stuff um bring it out of photoshop save it and then bring it into lightroom uh because lightroom I, I do a bunch of photography and lightroom has some really great uh photoshop does the same thing it's basically the, the adobe camera raw filters um but you i can i can scroll through these are like you can sort of start to see a progression here. This, this was like some of the earlier renders. And then as I like kind of step through some of these, I'm testing different lighting. Uh, and there's very small changes being made between some of these images. Sometimes I'll, you know, the eyes I'll make a little bit smaller or bigger. There's a lot and test it with different lighting. Uh, so I'll, I'll also test with different HDRs, uh, different just straight up uh, light sources. So this is just a single light source on here. So I test with all of these different types of, um, light setups and you'll see like if we go to here for example so this was one of the things where i felt like some of the details in the cheek were just getting a little bit too muddied up and you can see as i get a little bit further along i decided to kind of hand paint in a bunch of pores into the cheek area that better that were a little bit more defined and, and looked a little bit better sometimes things can get muddied up a little bit uh and so that's where i'll look at it in the test render and say you know, like even on the tip of the nose the tip of the nose was getting it looks good but it, there's there's some areas that are just not descript enough. They just, it just gets a little bit muddy and you can kind of tell in this one here that I came in and started adding in those individual pores with little black heads and that sort of stuff. And then I kind of start going through here and then, um, yeah, you can see a lot of that detail stuff there. So I, I cover all that. And then I, the, the, another layer on top of that is, um, like a microstructure noise on top of the skin. And a lot of this uh, comes from looking at photo reference. So if you start to look at really high resolution uh, close-ups of people's face, you'll see that there's not only pores, but there's also like a really fine, very thin layer of skin over the top that's very kind of bumpy and noisy. Uh, and that kind of breaks the highlights up even a little bit more. So again, I'm just kind of testing. Uh, and this, you can see like testing in different light setups, like this now feels too shiny overall. So I kind of look at it and determine, do I need to tone down the gloss or knock down the specular layers a little bit? And I slowly just start to like inch it forward until I get up to like these later renders here. Uh, and so I did a bunch of, was spending a bunch of time, like looking at these different test renders. And then uh, I wanted to kind of stop doing that sort of work until I got the hair taken care of because the hair adds like another... Uh, layer of quality in here that it can be hard to really get an accurate feel for the character until you start to place the hair on there. 
Um, I do things like, like when I come into here, um, very early on as part of like the, uh, block out process, I'll do stuff like this where I just take rough geometry and put it in place just to get a sense for what he'll look like with some hair mass. But, um, like you can get pretty deceived. I've found with trying to get this narrowed in and look correct, uh, especially in the eye area when there's no brows and there's no eyelashes it creates this really weird thing. And so this, all this stuff got up to a point where I was like, I gotta, I just have to stop for a little bit and get the hair in place so I can accurately start judging things. So you could see, I started to get the hair in place here and I can use the, the camera raw thing here to kind of like boost my values a little bit. Um, so I can see things a little bit better. And then I'll start doing like close ups of things to see how the hair is holding up. You can see up in here, all this like fine noise. A lot of that is that that very fine microstructure bump noise that's going on on the skin, even up through here, you can see there's the, the basic pore structure, but then there's some like breakup uh, over the top of that. So the hair is still, the hair shader is not a hundred percent worked out at this point. So uh, I'm still working on that. Um, but yeah, that, that's kind of the, the overall workflow. And so, yeah, like the, a lot of the course there's like, the, the, the course I, that's been, that I've been teaching, um, it, we, we kind of covered the head in like two weeks and this one actually goes into a little bit more depth on the head. So the, the, this new course is like about four weeks, three to four weeks on the head alone, just to get all of this stuff, um, polished up to a pretty nice, a nice point. So, yeah. And, uh, man, there's, when you're zoomed in on, zoomed in on some of it, it's like for a split second there, I thought it was a photograph. Yeah, well, I'm, tr I'm, tr I'm trying to get there. It's still, it's still, I don't, I don't think it'll ever fully get to, <laughs> I, it's, it's hard to get that completely photo real, but that's kind of, uh, but you're getting there, man, getting there. It's, it's taken, great. but, but I, I mean, I can look back at my work from say 15 years ago and it's like, it's definitely gotten a lot better, but like the progression, it, it takes such a long time to kind of start moving that needle forward. It, it, it's just, you know, hours and hours and hours. And, and I think, um, yeah, I was telling you guys the other day that um, the biggest thing I think that's changed for me recently is just like the depth, I think, that I've been going into. So if we kind of go back to some of this stuff like um, that I did, I don't know, a couple of years ago as sort of a starting to test out new skin shaders and uh, hair and that sort of stuff. I mean, it has some of that fidelity, but I didn't quite go to that same level of, of detail that I'm doing now. Like I could if I did close up renders of this, I don't think it would hold up as well as some of this stuff is holding up. So I've just been like looking at reference, uh, significantly more closely every single time I work on, on a new project and try to like bring one or two new things in from the reference that I'm seeing, uh, to try to make things look a little bit more believable. The, the thing I'm still kind of work, trying to work out a lot on is, is a bunch of stuff on the eyes. There's a couple different phenomenon that happened with the eye that I still haven't quite a hundred percent worked out yet. So, uh, I'm still kind of striving to get that, that stuff up to, a, up to a pretty good point. But dude, you're getting there. Thanks. Happy. Looks freaking Thanks. amazing. So, um, so, um, um, Andrea wants to, um, was asking what is cross polarized photography? So cross polarized photography is where, uh, you put a polar. So a polarizing, if you imagine, like, I'm sure some of you have probably had polarized sunglasses where, um, if you rotate the sunglasses 90 degrees, it looks different when you look through them. Polarized, uh, polarized sunglasses cut out light in a certain direction so it can eliminate reflections and glare and that sort of stuff. So what you can do is you can put a polarizing filter over your camera lens and then you also put polarizing um, sheets over your lights. And what it does is it basically completely cuts out uh, specular highlights and reflections off of uh, any type of surface that you're photographing. And so it makes for um, great source material to project on as it could either be skin, it could be, uh, I've, I've done a lot of experiments recently with cross polarized photography for doing scans of different textiles. So we'll, like we've been scanning a bunch of different uh, um, you know, straps and fabrics and that sort of stuff. And you'd be surprised, you think that fabric is very matte and dull, but if you actually look very closely at a lot of different fabrics, they're actually extremely shiny. It's just that there's the, the weave is so fine that it breaks that highlight up significantly that it actually looks like a matte, uh, like a matte and dull surface. So, um, 
yeah, we use the cross polarized stuff to knock, to knock all of that uh, reflectivity off of the skin. So I did some experiments. Let me, uh, this was, this was from uh, a few years back from the CGMA course that I was teaching. I did a whole bunch of cross polarized photography of my own face for, for the reference. And if you look at this stuff, you can see there's no reflections uh, coming off the surface. So you can sort of see a little bit coming off the eyes uh, from the two soft boxes. So you have to basically place uh, a soft box on each side of the face at about 45 degrees, and then that will knock out almost all reflections off the surface. So you can project this onto the surface cleanly and you don't have to like get in there and start to hand paint out uh, reflections. And then I use the camera raw here to um, flatten out the values and try to remove all the shading. So I'll, I'll bring the, the highlights down, bring the shadows up, bring the whites down and bring the blacks up. And that starts to flatten it out. So I don't have too much uh, additional shading information in here either. And you can like I, a lot of the, the texture reference that I used to use used to come from like 3DSK before people were doing cross polarized photography. And I just remember how long it used to take to like try to neutralize all the specular highlights off the skin. You'd have to hand paint or clone and do all that stuff. And this kind of eliminates uh, most of that work. So you get much cleaner, much more accurate results when you project it onto the skin. If you don't have the ability to shoot this stuff yourself, uh, there are a bunch of different sites that, that you can purchase this stuff from. So like Texturing XYZ has it, uh, 3D Scan Store has cross-polarized stuff. And uh, honestly, like you could look at it and say, oh, it's like 30 or 40 bucks to get a set of cross-polarized images, which, yeah, it could be seen as a little bit expensive, but the quality results and the time you'll save are like, I feel like it's well worth it. Cool. So yeah. um, speaking of that, Joseph has a question um, regarding um, what you just mentioned. I'm curious about your thoughts on building a library of all sorts of brushes and textures versus what may be provided in the studio. Uh, without studio resources, I'm hesitant to constantly spend money on packs of things. I may only use um, one of, one of, mm -hmm. and also uh, can't always afford the time to create alphas and tileable maps, et cetera, from scratch. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty good balancing act. Um, working in a studio, if there's stuff that, that we can make a case for that will expedite our process significantly, uh, we usually get you know, authorization to purchase that stuff or the studio will buy that sort of stuff because it'll, it'll expedite the process significantly. Like one of them, not necessarily a, 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 like brushes or, or alphas or anything, but it took a little bit of, uh, of negotiating, but because uh, Marvelous Designer is pretty expensive, but when we kind of proved out the results of Marvelous Designer and how much time it could save us and how much better the results were, uh, we pretty quickly were able to get that software in-house. And so uh, texture, stamps, that sort of stuff, it, it definitely is beneficial um, to have some libraries that maybe you purchase if it's something that you don't necessarily want to make. But I also think there are you should definitely, if you're, if you're newer and you're starting things out, d definitely create some stuff for yourself. Um, because there are times where you're not going to be able to find something off the shelf, uh, that's going to work for what you want to do. So like an example is, um, so this character is going to have this, um, but this, this very, uh, specific pattern, uh, like a tiling pattern on the jacket. And so there was no way I was going to be searching and there's no way I was going to find that pattern as like a tiling alpha thing. So you, there are times where you, you're not going to be able to find that stuff and you have to know how to make it yourself. So I wouldn't rely entirely on purchasing stuff and I wouldn't also re rely entirely on, um, on making stuff from scratch. Cause there's times where, you know, I can find something that's close enough to what I want. It, I'll, I'll spend the eight or $10 and instead of spending maybe, two or three hours to do it from scratch. But this was a uh, this tiling pattern that's gonna be on the jacket that there was just no way to find something that was going to look like this. So it's basically like this wool uh, tiling fabric underneath with like this stitched uh, design that's tiling um, over the top of that. So, you know, there was no way I was gonna find that anywhere. So uh, I had to kind of look at the reference and pick it apart and figure out how to make this kind of tiling pattern work. And so I, a lot of stuff like this, I'll model here in Maya and then send it over to ZBrush and extract a height map and a color ID map that I can use for texture painting. So yeah, it's a, it's a fine line. Like I, like I said, there's times where I'll just, I'll, you know what, 30 bucks for cross polarized photos of the exact skin tone that I want. I'm going to buy that instead of trying to like maybe find a coworker who's got that and has to commit the time to like letting me do the cross polarized photography. 
that's like a no brainer. I just do it and, and move on with things and keep on working instead of spending the time, like spinning my wheels on that stuff. So yeah, it's a little bit, it's kind of a fine line. You got to balance with that stuff, but you, you should, you should definitely know how to make it yourself because there are times that, uh, you will have to do things by hand. Man, that is, uh, that's pretty crazy. So what's the pro now I'm curious. It's like, cause it's like, um, do you just find it easier to model it at this resolution and extract the map from it versus just starting in zebra? I mean, in, uh, in, uh, Photoshop. Yeah, for Maybe sure. Because way. this gives me really good true height information. So mm -hmm. like, um, so I have, I have it broken down into different chunks. So I have my, the actual pattern here. I've got, um, I did some X gen fur on here to give it some like random fur strands. So before. like when the highlights hit it, this will like break up the highlights a bit. So we've got that. And then I have the actual, um, pattern here, which when you start looking at, like, I, I've spent a bunch of time, like photographing, different types of textiles for different, for different projects. And so once you start to like photograph and look at this stuff up close, you start to get a feel for like how this stuff is constructed. And when you really break it down, it's, it's actually very, very simple shapes. I mean, this is really just a torus here with another cylinder through it. And then it's just kind of duplicating it and, and then offsetting it to get this tiling pattern. And you just, I kind of just use the grid lines here and do a little bit of basic math of saying like, I want, you know, 20 of these going across if they're, you know, 0.05 uh, units across and I have to duplicate it X amount of times to get it to tile correctly. So it's just doing a little bit of math to get that, uh, to get that sorted out. Let me uh, see if I have it. Uh, yeah, let's go here. So this is like a bunch of stuff that I had shot a long time ago with a macro lens. And like, you look at this, it looks like a fairly matte surface. You zoom in and you realize like, it's actually, let me get to the sharpest part of it. Actually, let me get a different one here. So with a macro lens, you get to see all of this really interesting detail on here. And it's super, super shiny. Uh, and it's really just like these torus shapes that are kind of like interwoven with each other. So you can, like, I look at this stuff and I'll just model it, just a couple of these things and then start duplicating it. And you can make your own tiling uh, fabric patterns. So um, let me see if we can get, yeah, so you can see there's, and they're all kind of variations of, the same sort of thing. So you get a, you can start to get a really good feel of, of what's going on here. The other thing, uh, which I've been experimenting with recently is substance alchemist, which allows you to take photos of this stuff, um, with lights at different angles and it can reconstruct this in the software and make a, like a height pattern out of the, the photography. So that's another alternative as well. Um, but yeah, so yeah, this kind of the, I just break it down into individual components and then start to start to reconstruct it piece by piece. No, nah, dude, looks, uh, looks great. It gets the job done. Yeah. yeah it's, it's, it <laughs> so, looks, yeah. Cool. So, um, Mattia wants to know, um, Hey Peter, what render are you using? Uh, and what kind of lighting, uh, do you favor, uh, for, uh, to look dev your assets, HDRI, softbox, um, both. Um, yeah, so I've, uh, I've used V-Ray for, for a number of years. Well, a long time ago, I used Mental Ray and, and, and I learned a lot about Mental Ray and, and uh, because I had learned so much, I was a little reluctant to switch renderers, but I switched to V-Ray and like, it never looked back, thank God, because Mental Ray was kind of a pain and it's now really not used. Um, so I used V-Ray for a number of years and then recently with Arnold being integrated into Maya, I've kind of started switching over to that. Uh, I really like the skin shader in, in Arnold. Uh, V-Ray does a great job as well. Uh, V-Ray has some benefits that Arnold doesn't and vice versa. I've just generally found I started using Arnold a little bit more just because a lot of the content that I'm making for educational purposes, most students are more inclined to use Arnold because it's just straight up built into Maya instead of buying a license of V-Ray. So um, I've been using Arnold. I've been really happy with it. Um, there's some really cool things that it does. In terms of um, going through like look development of an asset, uh, I kind of do uh, a variety of different light setups. So I'll test, and my initial tests were kind of like this, where it's a single light source that's kind of like a large area light and then I'll put a light behind just to test the subsurface on the back of the ears. And I'll usually get far enough along with this. This single light source allows me to really test and fine tune the subsurface radius. So sometimes when you, you know, render stuff like this with an HDRI, 
you could be tricked into thinking that the that the subsurface is either too deep or not deep enough. So I find with like a single light source, it's much easier to tell in like these shadow areas how deep the subsurface is going. And so this kind of gives me a pretty good idea of of how that's working. And the same thing with like other other elements too. Um, the only time I'll kind of deviate from this type of setup is if I'm doing any look development and rendering on stuff that's predominantly metal uh, because most of the look of a, of a metallic surface comes from the reflectivity. So if you have like a single light source and you're trying to render a, 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 a sphere that's gold, it's not going to look all that interesting because it's only going to look gold where the light is kind of hitting it and reflecting back. So for anything like more metallic, I'll do uh, HDRI. So as I kind of do things, I'll spend a bunch of time in this stage here. And you can even see on this guy here, I mean, this is, this here is just a single light source with um, an HDRI dome that has no texture applied to it. It's just straight up. Uh, like if I come into here and do Arnold light sky dome, uh, I basically just come into here and let's go to the attributes for this. Let me set this over to my uh, classic here. Um, on this, I'll just take this, either the intensity down to like 0.1 just to get a little fill light, or you could leave this at one and then take the color down pretty low and that would just introduce a little bit of fill light in here. But this is predominantly a single light source. So I spend a bunch of time there just tuning the subsurface, making sure that's looking good. Once I'm happy with that, then I move over to, to testing with different HDR environments to see how it's reacting to more or less fill light, uh, more direct HDR, more ambient HDR. So you can see here, you can see I can, I'm just doing a whole bunch of uh, different tests with different HDRs just to see how it reacts in different light setups because uh, not only will that the lighting change between HDRs, but the reflectivity parameters will change as well. And I want to test it in a variety of these to make sure that like I'm kind of getting an average look or view at what the surface reflectivity looks like um, so that I'm not like over cranking it or under cranking it. Um, the other thing that I found to be really beneficial, which uh, I had kind of covered in my one of my previous courses was looking at skin renders with different light setups. So uh, looking at skin with a, a very, very small, um, bright light source off to the side, you can zoom in and you can start to see like what the high frequency noise looks like. And then the skin, like, it's not like my skin, uh, oiliness has changed from this shot to, to this shot, but all I've done is I bounced the light off the ceiling. So it's a much larger light source. And so I like to test with large light sources and small light sources to just get an average look at the skin and make sure that it's not too shiny or too dull overall. So I kind of mix it up between large and, and, and small light sources as well of varying intensities to make sure that the reflectivity is looking correct. Cool. Cause what you don't, what you like, what you don't want to do is you don't want to render with like a large light source and then say, Oh, the skin's not looking shiny enough. Let me make it a little bit more shiny. And then you make it more shiny. And then you switch your light source to something like this, where it's really small. And suddenly your skin just gets completely like blown out and super glossy. So, um, you kind of have to, I, I, that's why I like to balance test with both of them. Cause I can get a, a read on how it looks in different light sources. Cool. No, that's great. That's a great answer. Um, so, um, how, how has character modeling changed in the last 10 years and what are the expectations now compared to then? Um, how has it changed? I think technically, I don't think a lot has changed. I think the tool set is still very, very much the same. Um, I think the thing that has changed is the fidelity and quality that, that people sort of expect to see. And I think a lot of that is not only driven by the technology that, that, has gotten better and better. You know, we're able to push poly count significantly higher and, and go into more depth on assets. But even within like the games industry, there were times back on like Xbox 360 and PS3 where you could take your color map of say, uh, you know, you have a shirt and you take the color map, you desaturate it and you uh, make it grayscale and you kind of call that your your detail normal map because it kind of looks like the fabric, but it you know, just didn't have the texture resolution or fidelity to actually fully display it. And so you could kind of move through things significantly quicker. Now we just have this like 4K TVs, much higher resolution, uh, you know, the PS4 Pro and some of these kits are now outputting much higher resolutions that the expectation is there to 
see detail and have the detail be more correct to what it's actually looks like in the real world. So I think the thing that's changed is like the tools and techniques haven't changed a lot. I think it just requires significantly more time and attention to detail um, as you go uh, further and further along with it. Like I am actually kind of freaked out a little bit about these 8K TVs and like the next generation of video game consoles because it's like, well, you know, suddenly are we going to be authoring, uh, you know, 8K and 4K textures where you're going to be able to zoom in and see every little fiber because a game environment, you know, you can walk up to anything you want. Uh, film and visual effects is a little bit different because the shots and the textures and the planning on the assets is really based around how that thing is going to be used in a particular shot. And sure, there's some stuff that is created to the highest of highest fidelities because they want to be able to see it from any angle. But there's a lot of assets that you know, sort of know where it's going to be placed and you build it according to that. Whereas game assets, it's like, yeah, you can see it from anywhere. So that, that attention to detail is, is the thing I think that is going to uh, make the process take longer. I mean, there's been things that have changed like 10 years ago, we didn't really have marvelous designers. So there was uh, uh, you know, cloth was a little bit different that that process has changed significantly. Um, scanning technology has gotten better and better. Uh, but I, I still don't think it's a replacement for certain types of, of genres of, of work that are being done. Like you can't really scan, you know, futuristic sci-fi stuff. You can scan current day and sort of uh, older stuff, but there's certain things that are just not scannable either. So I think it's still a mix. Uh, I don't, you know, I, I think I remember people asking this question a long time ago, like, oh, do you think the character artist job is going to get diminished and slowly be replaced? And it's like, people were afraid of that 10 years ago. And it, it really hasn't changed. If anything, like where I work and most studios that I see is like, more and more people are being hired to do the work because there's just the, the, the quality has to be higher and it just requires more time. Cool. Yeah. Um, and I, yeah, I completely agree. I think, uh, whether it's real time characters or, you know, just higher, yeah. you know, like feature film, you know, type high res character, uh, quality characters. Yeah. I think, uh, the process is very similar in that sense. Um, so speaking of, of, of just, you know, just, um, certain level of fidelity, um, Galaxy wants to know, um, does the photogrammetry, um, does photogrammetry, is it often used in the modeling of characters um, or do we have to model and sculpt characters from scratch? Um, I sort of think it depends on the, the, the project really. Um, it's being used more and more. Like I said, the, the scan technology has gotten better. It's gotten less expensive to scan things. The quality is higher, um, but it still requires a, a bunch of cleanup. There's certain things that scanners are just never going to be able to get um you have you kind of have two different ways of scanning things you can scan things with with photography you have these complex photo rigs that have uh 150 cameras in them that that'll snap off a bunch of photos but you have issues with occlusion where it's not going to get stuff under the arms or uh underneath things so you also have handheld scanners that can scan things on the fly but with handheld scanners if you're scanning a person and that person moves then you have issues with scan quality there so um i think there's a time and place for uh photogrammetry there's a time and place for creating characters by hand there's a time and place for just about anything i think it just really depends on what the project calls for uh, and that's why i feel like uh, doing character art uh, you can't really rely on one thing over the other. I think you have to be pretty well versed in a variety of different tools and techniques to be able to accomplish uh, creating a character regardless of what the technology being used is. Cool. Yeah. Um, what would you say is the your most enjoyable aspect of creating uh, characters? Um, I think I, 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 I enjoy the initial sculpt phase where I get to kind of like work out proportions and and uh, sort out some of the, the overall big picture stuff. And then I really enjoy uh, a bunch of the look development and then some of the texture phase. And I, I say that because I feel like once you get over the hurdle of all the modeling, you get to the texture phase, you have so many things now that are like locked down and locked in place that it becomes a little bit more enjoyable to do some of that finessing and fine tuning. Whereas when you're in the modeling and sculpting phase, there's a lot of back and forth. If you need to transfer data from one mesh to another, there's a lot of like little steps you have to go through, which can kind of break your overall flow. Uh, but that's also why I like to pre-plan my assets out and um, make sure that the mesh is sorted out at an early enough stage so that I don't get caught up by those things. But yeah, I'd say early on, like blocking things out, big picture read stuff. I like that. And then, kind of getting things over the end line, fine tuning materials and textures are kind of like the, the parts that I enjoy the most. Great. 
so um, Calgar wants to know, uh, can you please talk about your methods on moving high res sculpt details into game engines? Since engines don't support most of that stuff, Arnold or V-Ray, um, yeah. or Arnold V-Ray support, uh, what's your general process? Uh, so it sort of depends asset to asset, um, for heads, for skin, that sort of stuff. Uh, the workflow is essentially the same as I feel like as doing like a high res asset is you do the whole sculpt, you add your poor wrinkle detail, all that stuff. And then we just bake it down to a lower res mesh with a normal map. So we'll, we'll use normal maps and we I'll typically use Marmoset to do my normal map baking, um, for other types of objects like, uh, accessories, clothing, gear, that sort of stuff. Uh, I do most of the rough, uh, and by rough, I mean like I get the sculpt up to, you know, a few million polygons, but I'm not adding into the sculpt. I'm not adding um, fabric detail. I'm not adding stitching. I'm not adding like those really, really fine details because I would rather control that stuff during the texture painting process. So if I start to texture paint stitches, um, let's say hypothetically I did stitching on the high res asset and I bake out that normal map onto a low res mesh and that normal map is 2K by 2K and that stitching I've made way too small in my sculpt, even though it looked good in the sculpt, it's way too small to actually read in the normal map. Uh, I've got a problem now where I have to go back to the sculpt. Hopefully it's on a layer, turn that layer off, redo the stitching. Whereas if I leave that for the texture painting process, I just texture paint it in, in painter, send it into the game engine. Uh, if it's too small, I just can redo it on the fly right there instead of having to go back five steps and, and repeat that process over and over and over. So um, I think I do a little bit more in texture for game assets. I do more of the detail work in texture as opposed to the sculpt. Whereas uh, film and cinematic stuff by nature sort of it has to have that that type of detail in the in the model uh, and then for like hard surface elements we can like for game stuff we hack high poly models um, together in zbrush pretty quickly like we just dynamesh stuff use live booleans the topology does not matter at all because we're baking it down to a low res mesh whereas for a film or cinematic asset you can't really throw in some you can't pass on a dynameshed or decimated sculpt to a texture painter and say, here, have a, have fun with this, you know? <laughs> so <laughs> you have to be like with, with film and cinematic stuff, you've got to be a little bit more on top of, of that, that model and make sure that it's, I mean, you know, you worked at DreamWorks, you gotta, yeah. you gotta, that thing has to be spotless. Like it's gotta be good and ready to go through every other part of the pipeline. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Um, so uh, talk a little bit about your class. Like, you know, what um, should students expect from, you know, taking this class? Just, you know, the overall outline. Yeah, sure. So um, the, what it, it's going to cover the entire uh, sort of process on a variety of different aspects of the character. So, you know, obviously if you're doing film and cinematic stuff, uh, human heads are, are always a big part of that. So that's why like three or four weeks is devoted into the head, the, the sculpting, the eyes, the hair, uh, the texturing, the lighting, the shading, all that stuff is covered to get it up to like a point like this. Um, and then the remaining parts of the course cover um, Marvelous Designer for doing clothing, which is applicable to film cinematic, also applicable to uh, game type of assets, game pipelines. Um, and then it kind of covers everything from generating the, the high res meshes, getting clean geometry, uh, and then moving the process all the way through to texture painting, how to, uh, leverage different tools, like some texture painting stuff. You don't necessarily have to texture paint everything in a painting program. You can leverage Maya, uh, and the shader networks to do a lot in the shaders. Uh, so it kind of gives a whole overview of the entire process from start to finish to, to kind of make you well-rounded and understand what the different parts of the process are actually like. So it's not just focused on making a character and that's it. It gets into setting up shader networks and understanding what textures need to be plugged in and how to drive certain aspects of shaders with different texture maps and how to move data back and forth between different programs. So kind of covers the whole thing from start to finish, but it does focus on like the bust of the character. So, um, which my, my uh, previous course had did show the whole character, even though I didn't like show it modeling every single part of the character. Um, what I've generally found is that to do a character in 10 weeks while learning and watching lecture content, it's, it's like almost impossible to build a full character 
uh, in a 10 week period, even if like without watching lecture content, even if you know exactly what you're doing, making a full character in 10 weeks is a pretty tall order. Um, and so it does focus on the bust and, um, because realistically, if you're going to make a jacket in marvelous designer and you're going to texture it and do UVs and make a clean mesh, there's not really any difference between that and making a pair of pants. So you can watch all the lecture content and then take, uh, all of what you learn from the course and then expand it out to the rest of the character, any additional accessories, you can do boots, gloves, you know, all that other stuff. It's pretty much the same workflow from piece to piece to piece. Uh, and so the course does focus a little bit more on a tighter, smaller portion of the character to, so that, uh, we can go a little bit more in depth on each, on each aspect. Cool. Um, yeah. no, I think that's great. I think anyone fortunate enough to take that class will benefit from it, you know, greatly where, uh, what skill level should they be in, um, entering the class? Uh, I would say it's like intermediate to advanced. Um, I mean, I, so because it has to move pretty quick by nature of doing a full character in 10 weeks, it doesn't really like, I don't stop. And, uh, for example, modeling in Maya, I'm not stopping and saying, you know, you hold down shift, right click, go to extrude, punch in this number. Like it, it doesn't cover that sort of stuff. So if you're new to Maya or new to modeling and don't have that, like those fundamentals of, of, of modeling and, and UV mapping and that stuff, I, I cover UVs and that sort of stuff, but not to the point of like, going over every single thing of how you cut something and where the button is to cut. It, it just says, I'm going to cut the UVs here and you see the kind of end result. So it is more advanced in that it just moves through some of those more basic skill sets a little bit more quickly. Um, yeah. So there is a, a certain expectation that you have a lot of that, that foundational uh, knowledge and understanding under your belt before sort of taking it. Cause you want to be a little bit more advanced in order to get the most out of it. Great. Yeah. Um, and the last question, because we're coming up on time, um, what sure. advice would you have for someone um, trying to make it, break into the industry now as a junior character artist? As junior, um, so there's, I get, actually get this question a lot. There's a, there's a few different pathways you can, you can go with. One would be, um, and, and I know a bunch of guys that I work with who started on different teams within our studio. So they've come in as environment artists or, uh, effects artists. Um, you can often look at uh, different uh, job postings. And if there's something that's still art related and still within the realm of what it is you want to do, sometimes it doesn't hurt to get your foot in the door, start doing that work, build some rapport with other people in the studio, and you can transition. Like we've, I think we've had on my team at work, we have like three or four guys, I think, that have transitioned from other teams just because they had proven themselves in whatever discipline they were in. We saw their work. We're like, yeah, we can, they're, they're good to start on this team. We can train them up on, on how they're doing on how to do this stuff. And so no, having somebody in the studio who, you know, it's, it's, it's easier than taking a risk on someone you potentially don't know. So that's one way to get in. The other is um, having a, a small, but I think quality focused portfolio. So even if you only have like two or three and two or three things in the portfolio, if it's all to like a, a really nice, high quality level, that's also enough. And, you know, you don't even, I don't even think you have to have like full characters. Like if you want to have three or four quality things, do what I'm doing in this course and, and do a few different busts. You know, you can do head, hair, some clothing and some accessories. And if it looks good, that tells me that you know how to, how to do that stuff. I don't need to necessarily see the entire full character to get an understanding of if this person is good enough for that type of work or not. So, um, yeah, I think spending the time, uh, having a, a, a good quality focus portfolio is, is, is beneficial as well. The other piece of advice I would have is keep an eye on the different studios that you potentially want to work for, get an idea of what projects they're working on and, uh, start to do some research on when those projects will launch because typically a, in a year, like leading up to a launch of whether it's a game or a film or something, studios ramp up and bring in a lot of people to help out. And a lot of times, uh, depending on the, the workload and if you can prove yourself, a lot of times those people end up staying on. So it's a good way to get in because studios are like, you know what, we only have like a month here. We need to get people in. Let's, you know, if somebody's close, maybe not a hundred percent what we want, but they're close. We'll bring them in and, and start working with them and, and we can train them up on what we want uh, and what we need them to do. So that's a great time period to kind of get your foot in the door as well. That's great. Thanks. Yeah. Pete. yeah. So, um, I think we're coming to the end. Um, you know, first of all, I'd definitely like to um, thank Pete for 
just sharing his experience, you know, and his overall process with us and just taking time out of his busy schedule. So thank you so much. Yeah, Pete. Thanks for having me. This is fun. Thank you.